Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I have a special guest, Chris Benson. Chris is the Chief Investment Officer for Reliant Investments, a subsidiary of Reliant Real Estate Management and one of the top 30 commercial self-storage operators in the US. Chris is part of the Investment Committee and develops institutional quality self-storage investment opportunities for accredited investors. Chris's investing goals have always been about changing the paradigm of trading time for money in order to have time for more of the things we love to do. Likewise, investing in real estate has been Chris's steadfast path to passive income, and he is passionate about inspiring others to change their mindset around investing for their future. So today, I'm excited to welcome on the show, Mr. Chris Benson. Chris, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, good morning, Jacob. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Well, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, what drew you to real estate investing, how you ended up in this world? Yeah, for sure. I'd be happy to. So my background really is in sales. My first job out of college, I worked for ADP, which is a payroll company. I sold uh, payroll to business to business and followed that path for many years. So from the business to business world, went into medical devices and uh, worked for two medical device companies, most recently Intuitive Surgical. They make the Da Vinci robot. And if your listeners haven't seen that, they should Google it. It's a pretty incredible technology. And I was very fortunate to be a part of each step of my career path. But really, my career was built around sales. And Jacob, I still remember waking up. And I think I was 28. As I get older, I might be making that age younger and younger. But (laughs) I remember waking up and thinking, well, I don't think I can do this another 30 years. I was very fortunate that I made great money. And for all other essential metrics, I was very successful. But my lifestyle was really tough. I mean, the work-life balance, there was none. I traveled three, four days a week. And ultimately, as you get older, I think you realize the only thing that you can't replace is time. And for me, that was the big push for real estate was I had the realization that instead of trading my time for money, I needed to find a way to make my money make me money so that I have the time to do what you just said in the bio, essentially the things that we love to do. So that was the real catalyst that got me into real estate. Yeah, sure. So here you are working for corporate America, got a really good day job. I think many people find themselves in a similar position, but have a hard time figuring out like how to break out of that routine, how to break out of that rat race. So what did that look like for you? You know, was real estate the immediate first like clear path or did you do other things first? For me, what I saw as the path to passive income was real estate. That's sort of what made sense to me. Well, I'm not a super creative person. I'm an executor. So if you give me something, there's a pretty good bet I'll figure out how to make it work. But I didn't see myself creating a business or something where I could essentially create passive income from a royalty stream or licensing or something along those lines. Real estate was just easy. It's numbers. So no matter what asset class you're working with, certainly there's different complexities to all of them. But essentially, when it comes down to it, it's just numbers. And I could evaluate numbers. So right off the get-go, not to say that I knew what I was doing, but I could at least look at a pro forma and understand, okay, this is how we're going to evaluate income and expenses. And my original original plan, Jacob, if you want me to get into that story was I started like many real estate investors do with single family rentals, or in my case, it was a duplex. So small residential commercial real estate or a small residential real estate. And the original plan was and I I got this from bigger pockets, actually, which I did a podcast with not too long ago. And I told Brandon, thank you. So at one point, one of the guys in bigger pockets had said, look, you just got to pick a net number what you're trying to make per apartment. And so mine was 200 bucks. So if I could make net net 
$200 per door, then I felt good about that pro forma. And whether my expense ratios were correct, from what I know now, probably it was being a bit naive, but basically that's how we went into it. And so we were underwriting deals with the idea that we can make 200 bucks a door. We did that and we acquired a pretty good sized portfolio on the duplex and quads and all in the county in which I lived. The challenge that I realized really quickly was <laughs> it wasn't scalable. So my original thought is if I can get to 50 units at 200 bucks a door, well, that's 10 grand a month, net, net, that's a pretty good deal. It doesn't replace my income, but if I had to, I could live off of that. It would cover our expenses. So that was the original plan. And what I realized was one, I hated the operation side. That is not my strong point at all. And two, <laughs> yeah. I really didn't like dealing with the people, not to sound elitist in any way, shape or form, but you know, we were renting B, B minus type properties and the people issues always seem to be a part of me. Even if I could outsource the plumbing, electrical and that kind of stuff, the people part always plagued me. So what happened from there, and then I'll take a breath, but what happened is we ended up selling that portfolio of projects. So I had a little bit of equity and, and again, I made good money. So I had some capital to deploy. And essentially I wanted, there was a another podcast or I read it. I can't really remember who said it, but I heard a quote that said, big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money in small deals. And so that really resonated with me. And what I got into was I wanted to get into commercial multifamily. And so I called a family that I had gone to church with when I was a kid. And I hadn't talked to the patriarch of the family in 15 years. And I randomly called him one day and said, Hey, Steve, it's Chris Benson. I want to build some commercial or I want to build some apartments. What do you got? I got a little bit of money. Do you have an opportunity to do that? And long, long story short, he had just had a conversation with the municipality where they had a piece of land that they wanted to develop and they were searching for class A housing. So we built a 64 unit apartment complex in phases in a town not too far from where I grew up in. That was my first step into big boy real estate, right? Where the dollars were real, the consequences were high, but also the upside was there. So that was what really turned the light bulb on for me. Yeah, sure. Well, I think uh, your path's very relatable to a lot of people out there in corporate America, or they're working some day job, they want to get out of that rat race, stop trading their time for dollars. So obviously, the people listening to this podcast or have an interest in real estate. So it's usually the path sure. they take, right? Buying that duplex is like a really common first path. And then you start to scale that thing, you buy a duplex here and a fourplex there, and you realize it's not really that easily scalable. You know, you can't really get to a scale where you can like completely unplug from the business and, you know, just stop dealing with those people problems like, you know, you're experiencing, right? So yeah, it's interesting to see how you kind of made that transition. I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to, you know, get to bigger deals. I really like what you said about big deals and small deals are the same amount of work, just different numbers. So yeah. And it's Jacob, it's interesting, like the more that I've done, that statement stands true. So and not to get ahead of myself in the story, but my arm of the business at Reliant is I manage the equity arm of the business, right? So my job is to raise money for the projects that we're buying. And when you talk to individual investors, or if you talk to a family office or an endowment or a pension fund, the same amount of work is deployed, right? The underwriting that an individual investor goes through typically is similar to what an institutional investor is, except the individual investor is going to invest a lot less. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I mean, it's that that thing where, look, you have to educate yourself. You have to have enough experience to make good decisions. But I will tell you, you don't want to go into big stuff blindly. But when the time is right, like Grant Cardone talks about 10xing your life, right? So it's about being able to think larger, because that's ultimately how you're going to scale to what most people are searching for, right? That freedom of making your money work for your money. Yeah, we'll talk about the mindset piece of that, because you just brought it up. And I think it's a really good point. Oftentimes, it's not in the nuts and bolts of, okay, I've got to go out and start looking for bigger deals or whatever it might be like, you know, the day to day actions, but rather the mindset of making that transition from say that smaller multifamily space to the you know larger multifamily commercial space. What did that mindset look like for you when you're making that transition? Naivety. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, look, like if I knew what I knew now, I don't know if I would have jumped the way that I had then. But here's what I would tell you is most of the things in my career, both real estate and, and corporate, the best opportunities have come from two things is one, cold calls, like being willing to call someone and say, hey, I'm trying to do this. Is there an opportunity? for us to do something together. And then two, the other thing is being willing to jump is when you see that opportunity, being willing to do something with it. And, you know, Jacob, I, I, I'm not telling you I did that without fear or anxiety. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, 
person where I'm this stoic, brave individual, but I have a, a wife who's super supportive and she's very risk tolerant. And she was basically saying, hey, what's the worst that can happen? You go back and get a job. You have a fantastic resume. You don't want to lose your house and that kind of stuff, but it's just stuff. And I think that's the thing that most people, Jacob, get hung up on is fear. And I do too. I, even today, like there are things that certainly still give me angst. But if you're trying to grow and you're trying to change, you have to jump. And if you don't, 10 years from now, you're going to be looking in the mirror saying, I should have done that. And that's the piece for me, I think, Jacob, that was especially leaving my last job, the job that I had, people would die for, right? I made a ton of money. I was at an incredible company. And walking away from that is hard. But that was the thing for me. It was like, look, I don't want to be five years from now and saying, man, I should have started then. So I think that jump piece. And then one other tidbit that I'd give you, every one of the opportunities I've been a part of that have been successful is having great partners, understanding what your skill set is, and then finding somebody else who complements those has been huge for me. I don't like operations. I just don't like to do it. And so I've been fortunate to find people who really get into the nitty gritty. And when you can find a good partner to, to complement what your skill set is, boy, that's a match made in heaven. Yeah, sure. I think I've heard this uh, phrase that says something along the lines of like, salary is just a bribe to keep you from uh, forgetting your dreams. It's a good one. There's another quote that, you know, we can throw in there, just kind of a sticky things that you can have in your head to take the island, you got to burn the boats. And that was the big one for me. It was like, look, if I'm going to be all in, I got to be all in. Because for many years, I was trying to manage career, real estate, and also building sort of this investor platform that we have. And it's hard to have your feet in a whole bunch of different puddles. It's a lot easier when you say, okay, I'm all in. And then you go and do that. So that would be my, from a mindset standpoint, like you're never going to know everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. And if you wait until you do, you're never going to do anything because yeah. you never know until you're in it and mixing it up. And then that's when you start to get the epiphanies of like, oh, this is how this works. And I either like it or I don't. Well, it seems like one of the things you've done, Chris, is constantly push yourself outside of your comfort zone. You've got a really good day job, right? Things are fine. You could just essentially coast, make that be just fine for you. But here you are going to start buying some duplexes on the side and growing that and taking on all the headaches we know that come with that type of thing. And then you know, transition from that to larger multifamily and then, you know, the things you're doing now. So you're always pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, being a little bit scared and doing things that are kind of challenging you, it seems. Yeah, no question. It comes down to I'm a, I'm a motivated person, right? So if you can identify what your goal is, for me, it's pretty clear for me to say, all right, here's what I want. I know what has to happen to get there. Now, whether I want to do those things, that's the hard part, right? And that's for most people, Jacob, right? Like they know what they want. It's just a question of are they willing to do what needs to happen to do it? Yeah. And I've been fortunate enough that I guess I'm blessed with that a little bit where the discipline piece and the ability to say, okay, this is how you do it. Go do that. That's my strong point. Like I said before, like if you put something in front of me, I'll figure out how to make it work. And I'm self-motivated to do the things that need to do to get there. Now, have you always had that really clear sense of vision and that big picture thing or whatever that is, like that end goal for you? Or has it changed over time? What's that like for you? That's a great question. So I'm 39. So it was around that 28 30 range, right? And I have two boys um, who are like little clocks that follow you around, right? I mean, <laughs> so I have an 18 year old, we started really early, I have an 18 year old who just graduated high school, and then I have a 13 year old in middle school. So it's the time piece that really resonated with me that sort of gave me that big picture. You go through your 20s, and you're invincible. There is no long term. And I think having kids early made me sort of, I guess, reflect on what's important sooner, but also just perspective on what are the things that I actually want to do. Because other thing, Jacob, and this is probably similar to a lot of people who came through my background, I was motivated by money. And when I made money, it didn't really make me any happier. <laughs> it was just like, okay, well, I did that check that box. And you know, some for some people, it's a number, you know, and when you hit that number, you're just like, well, that's not any different. So for me, it was well, if it's not the money piece, what is it? And for me, it was the freedom aspect. I was like, that's what I want is I just want the ability to do what I want to do when I want to do it, whether I'm working or not. That's a really interesting point you bring up being motivated by money. Some people you tell them on the surface, that seems kind of taboo, bad, right? But do you think that's a, a thing to be motivated by? Do you think that's a okay thing to be motivated by, at least in the interim? Well, look, money's not everything, but it helps. I mean, even if you have freedom, but no money, that's a tough balance. I'll give you a quick funny story. So I love to ski. And so we ski a, a fair amount. Last year, I was in Jackson Hole skiing and my college roommate lives there. So one day he was working. I said, I'm going to take a lesson. 
and I skied with this guy, Jacob, and, and I'm a pretty good skier. And he's literally the greatest skier I've ever seen. It was like pouring water down the mountain. It didn't matter what kind of terrain we were on. And for those of the listeners who've been to Jackson, there's some nasty, nasty stuff. And his name was Sam. And I said, Sam, that is unbelievable. I was like, how many days did you ski? He's like, what do you mean? How many? He's like, every day, bro. <laughs> that freedom. But he sacrificed a lot, right? Like he lives in a hotel room and his stove is a hot plate. But he gets what he wants out of it, which is he's on the mountain every day. And so for me, I think it's a balance between those things, right? I want the ability to be on the mountain every day, but I don't want to live in a hotel room and cook on a hot plate. <laughs> you got to pick one or the other. Or you build a lifestyle that allows you to do both. And I don't think money is a, a bad motivator, but I will tell you that making it doesn't make you happy. Like that number that I know I had when I made it, it was like, oh, it was just kind of a check the box and on to the next thing. So I think it's a great motivator, but it certainly shouldn't be the end all be all because I think you'll be disappointed when and if you hit that, then you got to find something else that makes gives you a little bit of motivation every day. Yeah, no, that's great stuff. I really like talking about mindset stuff, especially with a guy like yourself. It's so uh, interesting to see like what drives you, how the way you approach things. So really cool there. Now, switching gears a little bit, let's pull back and talk about the real estate piece. You built sure. this portfolio of smaller multifamily properties, you know, did this development deal. Tell us what came next for you. What did that journey look like? So in the middle of building the 64 units, I had another buddy that I grew up with who introduced me to syndication. He was building and I'll give him a quick shout out. It's called City Point Capital in Boston. His name is Chris as well. Actually spade, spelled with a K. That's why we were friends in high school. We're the only two Chris's with a K ever. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but in any event, so Chris started flipping flipping homes in South Boston and flipping homes is probably understating it. He started doing townhouses. His first project, he or second project, they did a nine unit townhouse building and they raised $900,000 of investor money. And I didn't even understand what syndication was or that it existed. He called me one day and just said, Hey, I got to raise 900 grand for this project. And I said, how, what do you do with that? And he walked me through the syndication process. And that's when the light bulb went off for me where kind of the confluence of what my skill set is and what I did every day work together really well. So what ended up happening was my original plan was, okay, I'm going to raise money because I have this network of guys like me who work at Intuitive, guys and gals. I work with surgeons every day, hospital executives, and they all knew I was doing real estate and said, hey, I'm interested in the next project. Keep me prized. So that group kind of grew organically. And when I realized syndication, I said, oh, now I can leverage their money and do not just what I have capital to do, but grow. The original plan, Jacob, was I was going to go do my own apartments. And what I realized was back to I hated the operation side, I knew that I was not going to be a good apartment operator. I hadn't spent 20 years of my career doing that. I was a salesperson. So my hypothesis was that is if I could go to a couple operators who did do real estate as their professional career and raise equity for them, could I get ownership on the back end, which ultimately gets me what I want, which is mailbox money, right? checks that are coming in. So that's what I did. I connected with three multifamily operators that I worked with for four years where we invested in their projects, mostly in primary markets like Dallas, Fort Worth, Atlanta, Phoenix area. And that worked really well. So my focus at that point was growing the number of investors so that I could bring more and more equity to the deals. And so my role really was to do the underwriting, make sure the properties they were buying fit what we wanted. And then I would bring that out to our investor group and give them access. Essentially capital raising, right? That's what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And that worked really well because that's what my skill set is, right? Like inherently I'm a salesperson. Yeah. So we did that for four years. And then one of the operators that I worked with came and said, Hey, Chris, as cap rates have compressed in this multifamily space, we're going to stop buying. And that was a big wake up call for me when essentially what they were saying is that it was very challenging to find value. And this operator has a billion dollars plus under management, so they can afford to be patient in the market. So I thought I better go look for another asset class. And that's what brought me to, to self storage, Jacob, is I really like there were three pillars that I kind of did my homework on. And that's what brought me to self storage as an asset class and ultimately made the transition there. And what are those three pillars exactly? 
Yeah, so first is returns, right? I wanted to see how the asset class performed. And Jake, I can actually send you the data set that I use for comparators. It's data from the National Association of REITs. And it's a public data database. And they got 25 years plus of data. So it's a nice reference. So the returns, if you look at self-storage in the national... So these are all the publicly traded companies in this asset class. In the last 25 years, storage did just under 17%, which is pretty incredible. Apartments were just under 13%. So they outperformed apartments in the last 25 years. So I thought that was an interesting data point. Just to give you some baseline, the S&P 500 did just over seven in that same time frame. So it kind of validates our hypothesis that real estate investing definitely has some upside to it comparatively to the, the equities market. So return was one. The second was protection. I wanted to see what happened in the downturn. So we went back and looked at the data from 2007, 8, and 9. And storage did really well, actually. So storage lost less than 4% of the value. Apartments, it was closer to seven. Retail and office got hit hard, double digit losses. And then the S&P 500 was down 22% plus. So storage had that protection. And kind of the hypothesis behind that is even in downsides, people don't get rid of their stuff in America. They just don't. <laughs> so you catch them on the way up as they're doing well, they buy more things, put it in storage. Boats, RVs, things like that, right? All kinds of stuff. You'd be amazed at what people store in storage units. And then on the way down, when they have to downsize, they don't get rid of their things. And so storage performed really well and had that nice downside protection. And then the third reason was really why I've hitched my wagon to storage was there are six publicly traded companies that own about 25% of the storage market. So there's five REITs. Those are the, if your listeners are driving on the highway right now and just look off an exit ramp and there's probably a Cube Smart or a public storage or an extra space yeah. in the market. If you're anywhere near a populated area, just look out the window and you'll start to see them. They're everywhere. But they own about 25% of the market. The other 75% is very fragmented. So you still have, you have operators like Reliant. We're the 27th largest largest self-storage operator, and we have 48 properties we own. Well, there are tons and tons of mom and pop operators where mom and pop basically means they have one or two facilities, right? And those are great opportunities for us to go in and create, essentially execute on a business strategy and drive revenues through that. And so for me, that was what I saw as the consolidation or the roll-up opportunity, not too dissimilar than like a private equity group would do, where we say, okay, can we build a portfolio large enough where we become a really interesting institutional capital target? And that's what we're trying to build at Reliant. So ultimately, Jacob, that's what got me to storage um, was those three pillars. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think I like how you have broken those down and been very clear on, okay, I want returns, I want protection, and then I want opportunity. Yeah. So I think that's really cool. And I've heard a couple other qualitative things. You kind of alluded to it about self-storage is like when people are downsizing, they're not getting rid of their stuff. They might have to move from a, a home to an apartment, but that just means they're going to go put their stuff in storage, right? So in the upsides, it's great. And the downsides still does well. So kind of that recession proof asset class, if you will. Well, I hope so. We'll see what happens in the next correction. I mean, the thing that's happened since 2007, 8, 9 in storage is there's been a huge development cycle. So 2017 and 18, we delivered the most new net rentable square footage in the history of the asset class. Yeah. So there's a lot of new facilities. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this next correction, how storage is impacted, because there's a lot more supply now than there was in 2007, 8, and 9. So we'll see sort of where those opportunities. And for us, I don't mean to say we can't wait for the next correction, but there's going to be a big buying opportunity. When you have this development glut, and there are going to be people who lose their projects to the bank. We have not seen a bank-owned property at Reliant in three years. We're excited to have those types of opportunities come to us because that's where wealth is created, right? Is in the downside, you're buying. And in the upside, you're selling. That's what we're looking forward to. Do you think that there's a bit of a lower barrier to entry in developing these types of projects comparative to specifically multifamily, just given the nature oh, of the, sure. the structures, right? They're really just essentially metal buildings unless you've got a really nice inner city multi-story uh, storage facility. Like I see a lot of those in Houston specifically. Yep. That's sort of the next generation of storage, right? Um, 
but even those, Jacob, comparatively to multifamily are easy to build, right? I mean, it's cement floor, right? You're pouring a, a floor and then you're building tinker toys on top of it with aluminum studs and roll-up doors. So the barrier to entry is less than multifamily because of the cost to build these is significantly less than multifamily. The things that are happening in the marketplace that maybe are creating some of the barriers is municipalities are now pushing back as well, right? You get two or three new developments in a, a municipality and all of a sudden the city's asking, "Why? what are we doing? Why are we building? building more of these. And so that's the piece that there are some markets like Denver changed their zoning, right? Where only storage could only essentially be in one area of their development map. And there's a town that we have a facility in in South Carolina that put a moratorium on all storage development. I think it's for eight months and then they're going to kind of reevaluate from there because they feel like it's they have too many storage facilities. So there's definitely a low barrier to entry and, and that's contributed to this development cycle. The good news is so far, the development cycle has as the lease up has kept pace. So there aren't people developing and losing properties, they're able to fill them thus far. So we'll see. Yeah, sure. Now, if you had to just kind of quickly compare and contrast the real high level, some quantitative, qualitative features of multifamily versus self-storage, how would you categorize those? I kind of think of it like, okay, obviously in a self-storage, you don't have the tenants, termites, toilets kind of thing, but maybe mm-hmm. at the end of the day, sometimes you wind up with a storage unit full of junk you don't want, right? So what are some things there to talk about? Well, it's a different business. We may not have termites. Sometimes we get rats though. So <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a problem. You know I mean, think about it. You got a whole bunch of garages and sometimes people put stuff in there that shouldn't be in a storage unit. You still kind of have the rodent pest issue, right? I mean, that's any real estate that you have any scale on, you're going to have that. But the tenant interaction is definitely different, Jacob, right? So think of multifamily as a highly tenant interactive business, right? Where you may have somebody for 13 or 12 months in a lease, but that tenant, for the most part, you're, you're keeping them happy throughout the lease, but you got them no matter what. With storage, our leases are 30 days. So the customer service aspect is significantly more. That's how we differentiate ourselves, right? Storage is a convenience business. So we can't offer amenities. You don't go to our storage facility because we have a a resort style pool and a (laughs) dog park our storage facility because it's close to your house or it's close to your work and it's convenient for you to get to. Yeah. So for us, it's a very operationally intensive business where we spend a lot of time. Um, we So Reliant, we didn't really get to that part of the story, but Reliant, who I work for, is a vertically integrated self-storage operator. So we are the management company as well as the people buying the facilities. And so a big part of our business for the operation side is training people on the customer service aspects because that's really how we differentiate ourselves in the market. We don't want to be the cheapest. And most of the time we're not, but that's one of the big differentiators between storage. So I would say lease time is one. And then just another quick aside is there's a whole bunch of ancillary income items that storage has that multifamily doesn't. So things like U-Haul truck rentals, locks, boxes that you're selling at the retail level, okay. tenant insurance. Those are things that are, we call them effort sales. If you have a good manager who's hustling, those people will push those revenues. You can see in a facility when those revenues start to drop that you probably have the wrong person at the desk or the wrong two people at the desk. So a little bit more active than multifamily because if you can get multifamily leased up, you got maintenance issues and certainly that's a big deal, but you get those people locked for 12 months most of the time. And our business seems to be much more active on the day-to-day customer service piece. Yeah, sure. Well, what does the future for yourself and Reliant Investments look like in just the near outlook of uh, self-storage units? So as a company, we have 48 properties in our portfolio. We've sold another 21. We're in the midst of raising some equity for our first fund, a $50 million fund where we're going out and buying value-add and stabilized self-storage facilities. Right now, our pace has been about 10 properties a year from a growth standpoint. And that's where we feel comfortable speed-wise that we can manage it appropriately. We think there's, a, as I had mentioned before, a big opportunity in storage. So we're going to keep buying. You know, As long as there's an opportunity, that's what we're trying to do and really scale up our portfolio to that 7,500 property range because it just gives us a, a different exit strategy when you have that amount of assets under management versus where we are today. To be able to peel off 25 properties and sell that portfolio, there's a whole different pool of buyers 
than there is if you're selling one or two. Yeah, sure. Well, Chris, it's been a lot of fun talking with you, just seeing your journey. It's one that's very relatable to many people out there, and that is working a day job, wanting to replace that earned income with some passive income or start developing some of your side hustle, if you will, and go out and buy that duplex and grow that and do some different deals and get into multifamily and then really start being intentional about things and wind up where you really intentionally want to be, which is in your role now with Reliant Investments, being the chief investment officer there. And it's kind of really cool to kind of see your path and see your journey. So appreciate you uh, kind of sharing that with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, as we're wrapping up here, we've got a lightning round, just a series of questions we ask every one of our guests. Are you up for it? I am indeed. All right. Well, the first question is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And what did you do to overcome that? I think we talked about it already, Jacob. I, I think it was fear, right? It was the one, it was fear and, and lack of knowledge. So to get over that, I mean, the lack of knowledge piece, you know, as well as I do, there's so many resources out there. I wish I had had a mentor earlier on to kind of push through that. But I basically self-educated, read a bunch of books. Bigger Pockets was a great resource. Yeah. When they were first getting started for me, it made me feel warm and fuzzy every day when I read through, through the forums and see other people going through those things. So that definitely was uh, my biggest hurdle. And then the fear piece, ultimately, it was just a decision that was like, okay, let's give it a run and see what happens. Yeah, awesome. Well, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success, Chris? That's a good question. I think from my perspective, and, and I don't know if it's teachable, but ultimately, I think the habit that's contributed the most is just the ability to say, hey, I'm going to go do this and then actually go and do it without anybody pushing on me. I'm self-motivated enough where if you say, this is what we have to do, I'm going to go out, figure out how to do it. Hopefully somebody's teaching me as well, but then go and execute on it. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've been blessed with is just that ability to self-motivate and be uh, naturally curious and go learn. Yeah, sure. Maybe it's not so much teachable, but I think maybe you could kind of grow that skill over over time, you know, mm -hmm. as you, you know, think of these new ideas, or whatever, just get out there and take action. If you think of something or you want to do something, just take a step and take another step. So yeah, awesome. Sure. Well, Chris, do you have an online resource you find valuable in your day to day? Maybe not for me, uh, day to day. I mean, there's a number of industry newsletter type things that I read specific to storage just to keep myself abreast of what's happening in the industry. I think for the majority of people, there's a couple websites I recommend. Have you ever heard of Ian Ippolito, Jacob? No. So he has a website called Crowdfunding Review for your investors who are looking for passive income investments or just feedback. I think he does just a great job. You may want to see if you can get him as a guest on the podcast as well. But he does a really nice job job of being thoughtful. He doesn't get paid by any of the sponsors. They've raised money for a few of our projects. And I'm really impressed with the education he puts out for free. I believe it's called crowdfundingreview.com, but definitely double check that. And then you can put maybe the link to it in his show notes. But yeah, we'll definitely do that. And then, look, I always love bigger pockets. I'm not as active on there as I used to be, but it's an unbelievable community. And there's some really savvy people on that site. And it's grown, obviously. It's a huge engine now. But anytime that you can go on to those types of free resources and connect with people, it's a huge opportunity. So I'd highly recommend them as well. Yeah, sure. We'll link both of those in the show notes. Obviously, everyone knows bigger pockets, but we'll link that newsletter. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have Ian on as a guest. So sure. Chris, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? I see a big bookshelf behind you. So you got any good ones? I didn't plan this, but we'll do it. So Shoe Dog, Phil Knight. Sorry. Yeah, okay. That was a really interesting read. And here's why is one started Nike. So obviously an iconic brand. But it, what was so interesting about his story is literally they were struggling to do payroll when Nike was Nike. Like when Jordan was part of Nike, until they went public, they were still, I don't want to say a mess, but they were a small business like Bootstrap. And they were still a huge company. And literally, they were struggling every week with major issues that you just wouldn't have expected from a company like Nike. And then when they went public, they had this huge infusion of capital and that allayed a lot of their fears. But what it did for me was to say, okay, the founder of Nike didn't have it figured out. Like, I mean, for you, and I'm going to give you an analogy. This was a bigger pockets analogy. And I know these questions are supposed to be quick, but this is a good one. Now let's hear it. So actually, Brandon from Bigger Pockets gave me this one. So I'll reference him. So he said, look, I live in the Pacific Northwest. West or used to. I think he lives in Hawaii now. But in Pacific Northwest, it's always foggy. And so 
when you are driving, you can turn your lights on. It doesn't matter. You can only see six or seven feet in front of you. And you don't know if up around the corner, you're going to drive off a cliff or there's a deer standing in the middle of the road. But the idea was all I'm working for is that next six or seven feet, right? But when you go that six or seven feet, another seven feet becomes clear again. And so his analogy was that as far as building your business, like you don't know what's going to happen a mile and a half down the road. But what you do know is I can see right in front of me. And when I see right in front of me, I'm going to go do that. And then once I get there, I'm going to see another six or seven feet. and I'm going to go do that. And really with Shoe Dog, that's his story. It's a great biography read that kind of, you know, when you have an epic, iconic brand like Nike to see they did the same thing was comforting for a small business like us. Yeah, sure. Well, that's Shoe Dog by Nike founder, Phil Knight. We'll link that book in our show notes for our audience members to pick up if they haven't yet. Last question in the lightning round, Chris, if you were to give advice to your 20 year old self to get started investing in real estate, what'd you go back and tell yourself? (laughs) Do it sooner. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I mean, look, the best tool in all of investing is time. Compounding returns is the most powerful tool, What, no matter what you're investing in. And so what I try to do with my kids is just help them understand the power of time. And 20-year-old me probably wouldn't have listened because I didn't. it didn't resonate with me yet. But I think that's the piece that you try to show people is it's not the money, it's the freedom that you're really seeking. Start lifestyle designing now. Build your life around what you want the end to be. When I was 20, I, it was like, well, I was still in college. So that probably wasn't a good time to talk to me. <laughs> but when I got out of college, it was just work, right? Like, okay, I'm going to work and make money. And there wasn't really a lot of forethought to what am I working towards? That would be the piece for me is start early, specific to the real estate, because another 10 years of real estate investing makes a huge impact in the overall picture. Yeah, awesome. I love that. Well, Chris, any parting piece of advice you'd like to leave with our audience members? Maybe something I didn't ask you that I should have? No, I think we covered a lot of it. I mean, just high level, I would say work to your strengths, find the things you're really good at, and then get partners for the ones that you're not. And then don't be afraid to jump. You got to be a little bit vulnerable to grow. And it's not that you're not going to make mistakes. You absolutely will. But that's where you're going to learn the most. Yeah, awesome. I love that. Well, Chris, it's been a lot of fun talking with you. If our audience members want to learn more about what you're doing, connect with you, whatever that might be, where's the best place for them to do that? So we got a couple of resources for you. If you want to learn more about what we're doing at Reliant, it would be W www.reliantinvestmentsplural.com. We also are about to launch an educational website specific to commercial real estate called chrisbenson.com. And that's Chris with a K. So it's K-R-I-S-B-E-N-S-O-N. And on there, we just have some educational contents for new investors to learn from uh, about real estate, commercial real estate, a little bit about self-storage. Cool. That's a good one as well. And then I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. So if you find me on LinkedIn, certainly reach out and be happy to uh, connect with you there. Awesome, Chris. We'll link all those sources in our show notes for our audience members to check out if they want to connect with you. Hey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Till next time. Thank you. My pleasure, Jacob. Have a good day. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Bye. All right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Chris Benson. Well, hey, I hope you got a ton of value from this episode. If you like what you heard, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. All of the resources we mentioned in the show today are in the show notes, so you can check those out at www.jacobayers.com or by touching right on your home screen on the podcast here. Well, hey, till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.